بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شيخ الله bless you أخي كريم أمين question one السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شيخ recently a Jewish person has come across me uh, who came across me who was who has interest in Islam but the one thing that is stopping them from embracing Islam is that they believe that the Torah is in its original form from when it was first sent down from Allah the question was, what proofs are there that say that the Torah has been changed? Quranic and historical references. And to clarify, the Jewish people who took Ezra as a son of God, he personally does not believe that Ezra has any importance in his religion. So that's why he got confused when he came across a verse talking about it. Jazakallah khairan mufti. May Allah bless you. Ameen. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. May Allah bless you as well. Dear sister and honest lamb. There are many ways of going about answering a question and about giving dawah to this Jewish man or this Jewish woman. What's important is, is that you don't always necessarily have to go on the offense. You don't have to attack all of the time. Sometimes all you have to do is just invite, open up the door, and call. Meaning, whether the Torah was changed or not, whether the Torah has been played with, distorted or not, things put in, things taken out, misinterpretation, etc. That's besides the point. The Quran is obviously, according to uh, everyone, you know, historical consensus came after the Torah. It came after the Torah. So we consider the Quran to be the final word of God Almighty. The last message. And the Torah was a message, a mighty message, a great message of God to those people, to that prophet, to that messenger, to that man, and to that nation of people. But another man came with another message which enveloped that previous message. And there's no need to get into the debate and the argument has it been changed or not. Because Musa a.s. is mentioned in the Quran like no other man. And Bani Israel... And the people of Musa, Qawmi Musa, are mentioned in the Qur'an in such abundance. And this clearly proves and clearly shows is that the Qur'an came later. So the Qur'an is including what the Torah had of good, of righteousness, of proper faith, and much more. So there's no need to get into the argument and debate of it being distorted historically. But this is the final message. Everybody clear on this so that we're on the same team. We're not fighting against each other, but I'm the last wave, the last dispatchment of troops. But we're on the same army. We're not here to fight each other. I'm here to fight with you, but I have new news. I have a, a fresher batch of instructions from that which you had. And I'm more highly trained than you are. My army is larger than yours and so on and so on. And so we're on the same team. There's no need for us to fight. We're together. Hmm? So it's not necessarily a need to get into contradiction and distortion. And it's very important, especially when it comes to the Christians as well. Many brothers, they do this and sisters, they do this. They talk about the mistakes in the Bible, the mistakes in King James, Old Testament, New Testament. What color was Jesus? Was he black? Was he white? Was it a French man that is in his form of Jesus? So on and so forth. The, the Bible is this, the Bible. There's no need to get into that because these people, they can attack the Quran and they can attack the prophet. And they can say things, and they can use the concept of manuscripts and historical evidence and this and that and so on and so forth. The Quran is the final word. And the proof for it is, is look at the Quran. Does the Torah talk about Muhammad by his name in detail? In detail? Does the Injil speak on these things in detail? No, but the Quran does. It talks about Isa ibn Maryam. It's a chapter in the Quran about Maryam and by Isa. How many times is Musa a.s. mentioned from Surah Al-Baqarah? All the way to Juz Amma, Suhafi Ibrahim al Musa. So that's what I think is the best thing to do in this situation. Wallahu alam. As far as Uzair, Ezra, so on and so forth, then, like any other issue, there's going to be historical context. There's going to be ins and outs, there are details, things that in which they agree on, things in which they differ on. The Jews of Arabia, uh, the Jews of Musa, so on and so forth, the different types of Jews, the Yahud. So I would avoid all of these technicalities by getting them to look at the beauty of Islam 
through the Quran and that which the Quran says about Musa salam, and his people. And that Musa salam, and the Prophet salam, he said, Lo kana akhi Musa hayyan lama wasi'ahu illa tiba'i. If my brother Musa was alive, he would have to follow me. And also Isa salam, will come towards the end of time, the second coming or the re return of Jesus. With, not with the crucifix, but with the sword saying, La ilaha Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And Allah knows best. That's in brief. Number two. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shaykh, inshallah, you're in the best of Iman and health. Everybody has their own personal struggles that they face. Whether that's on a daily basis or something that's on and off for years. But what I want to know is, how do you make that decision as to when you shouldn't be patient anymore? Or that is not an option. You always have to be patient in your situation. Inshallah, you understand what I'm trying to say. Barakallahu fika wa jazakallahu khairan. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ameen. And you as well. Alhamdulillah. Uh, inshallah, uh, with regards to the question, if you're talking about a struggle with another person, such as your husband or your children, or your mother or mother-in-law or something like this, then that's one thing. If you're talking about a struggle, a personal problem with yourself, then that's a different story. There is no end to the fight. You always have to be patient. The, the Muslim is always a mujahid. You always have to be a mujahid, a muhariba. You're always a warrior, always fighting. There's no quitting. Worship your Lord until death comes to you, until yaqeen comes to you. As long as there's breath in your lungs, as long as the blood is blue in your veins, then you have to fight in Allah's cause against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You fight against your own nafs, shaitan, the munafiqeen, the kuffar, whatever, however you can. As far as when it comes to someone else, like a husband or something like this, I've been dealing with my husband. My husband, he drinks alcohol. For the last 20 years, he's been drinking on and off. He went to rehab, so on and so forth. He beat me up. He beat up my kids, our kids. We were divorced. We were separated, so on and so forth. Whatever the case may be, then the situation is going to be relative and subjective from person to person. But the general rule is, is that if you lost hope, and you don't feel that the situation can be rectified, and it's no good, and it's, it's, the cancer has spread too far, it's, it's, it's rotten, it's rancid, the, the limb must come off. And if the limb doesn't come off, then I lose the entire body. Then that's when you cut off the limb, when there's no hope, and the odds are severely against the situation coming to a positive end. That's when you say, I can't do this anymore, I can't work here anymore. I can't be in this relationship anymore. Or my own son, you can't stay in my house anymore, son. I've been patient with you, so on and so forth. Or your daughter, and you actually feel that she's gone, unfortunately. You've lost her. Then you have to part ways. And Allah Azza wa Jalla sure knows best. You have to seek Allah's help. Question three. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mufti, may Allah bless you. I mean, in class 28, you were talking about 16 different styles that sabr comes across us in Quran. So in the review uh, session, we went over this one particular verse of Allah testing us by taking away our blessings for some time, but the patient will have glad tidings. So I thought it would relate to style 15, and style 15, it talks about practicing patience. My question is, how does one practice sabr and implement that into our daily lives? Jazakallah khairan. It's very simple. There may be certain things that don't necessarily happen to you in your daily lives. You may live a life of blessing. In which too many things weren't taken away from you. You're fortunate, chosen, privileged. Or you may live a life in which from time to time certain things are taken away from you. Naam, every situation is different. Every situation is different. Allah tests you by giving you things. And you have to have sabr to be patient. Not to use it to perform the haram. You have to be patient upon not having it. Like money. When you have money, it takes sabr not to spend it and waste it. And to be a spendthrift shopping or going to a haram place. And it also takes sabr when you don't have money, not to complain, not to cry, not to beg, not to do some haram to get the money. Um, Wahak at that. So oftentimes the different points that the ulama of Islam mentioned, Ibn Qayyim and others, sometimes they're included in others, in one way or another. In one way or another. Um, Allah tells us to have sabr. He informs us that He loves those who have sabr. He informs us of the reward of those who have sabr. It's all connected. Wallahu alam. As far as implementing on a daily basis, then when you want something, look at what the thing is that you want. Is it permissible? If it is permissible, is it beneficial? If it is beneficial, is it most beneficial? If that thing is haram that you want, 
then you have to fight yourself from staying away from it. So a sister, for example, she has a desire for a brother. She sees a brother walking down the street or working at her job. And she's, she's attracted to this brother. And there's no way that she can get married to him. She's married. She has a husband. All right? So her nafs cause her to look at him and to stare at him and to talk with him and flirt with him. Or allow herself to be noticed by him. The sabr says, no, you can't do that. I walk away. Don't go near him. Don't put the perfume on and walk by him. Don't send him a letter or a message. That's sabr. Even though your soul wants it, your body wants it. You have the ability to do it. Your husband doesn't know about it. But you know that Allah sees you and Allah will be displeased so you stay away from it. That's sabr. That's implemented in your daily life. Any other issue that you have to implement on your daily life with regards to sabr. Or something that's mandatory that you have to perform, such as the hijab, it's hot. I'm sweating, oh man, I'm sweating with the niqab and I can't breathe that well. SubhanAllah, have sabr, be patient until it becomes normal, until it becomes easy and simple. You get used to people staring at you or you see someone make a funny smirk on the subway or you're driving in your car in New York City. Have sabr. So whatever the thing is, it's obligatory that you have to do, you have to be patient upon it. And if it's haram, you have to avoid it, you have to be patient upon avoiding it. That's what's meant by implementing sabr. Looking at life, what you have to do, and what you should do, what you don't have to do, what you shouldn't do, what you can't do. Wallahu alam. Question four says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Sheikh. My question is, my father is in his 70s, and he has before Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, he was born Muslim, but a few years ago, he began practicing correctly after facing a severe stroke that caused him to be paralyzed from his right shoulder down. Performing Hajj might pose a difficulty because of his condition. Being his daughter, I could I perform it on his behalf? And parentheses, I don't have a ma- make me male sibling who is Muslim. Jazakallah khairan. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa rakatu. If your father was Muslim for all of these years and he began practicing correctly, what's meant by practicing correctly? Making salah, believing in the correct aqidah, the sunnah, or what? Is there a Muslim that doesn't know the hajj is obligatory? Do Sufis, Jamaat Tabligh, even Shia, and this person, and this group, and that group, and Fulan, and this one, and that one, this movement, do they deny Hajj being obligatory? So what's meant by started practicing correctly? Just because he wasn't doing everything right doesn't mean the Hajj was not mandatory, and they didn't know the Hajj was mandatory. So when he was alive for those years, he was Muslim, and he knew that Hajj was obligatory, uh... And he had the ability to do it physically, and he had the money, and he didn't make it, then that's a different story. That's a different story. As far as if he never had the money, he never had the ability, then that's also a different story. What's important is if you can make the hajj for him, whether you have to or whether it's a virtue, then do it with a mahram. If you don't have a mahram, then pay for someone to do it, bidin la ta'ala. Pay for a trustworthy Muslim to perform the hajj on his behalf. Worst come to worst, if a woman had to make hajj without a mahram by herself, the Hajj will be valid, inshallah, and it will be the issue of her traveling without a mahram on the airplane, which is a detailed issue among the people of knowledge. The Sunnah says, don't travel unless you have a mahram. So it's just that simple. The details come with regards to whether it was obligatory when he was in good health and in good strength, or whether it wasn't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should know his best. We ask him to give us fiqh in the deen and firmness upon. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.